Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, be back here. It's only my third visit, so I'm well behind Frank in my, to see my connections. <laughs> but um, I'd like to add to everyone's congratulations to Sesima and everyone who works here for a wonderful 20 years. And thank you for a very kind and generous invitation for me to return on this occasion. Now, this is the end of a very intense two days. I'm sure everyone's tired. For some of us, it's the end of nine days. <laughs> I'm surprised that I'm still doing this, but um, I know everyone's tired. I will try to make this interesting. Um, this may take me up to 25 minutes. If it does, please bear with me. I will try to do my best to make it reasonably quick. So, this is material from my uh, current book project, which will be called How Does a Battery Work? And um, what is it about? It's the history of batteries, but it's also the science of batteries. In our common scientific understanding of batteries today, there's a great dissonance that deserves to be highlighted. Any student asking this question, how does a battery work, is likely to be shown the schema of the Daniel cell, as shown there. This cell has two metal electrodes and two electrolytes, the liquid, separated by a permeable or porous barrier, or possibly a salt bridge. Either way, it allows the passage of ions so the current can flow. Each metal is dipped in its own solution, and the difference of the reduction oxidation potentials or redox potentials between the two sides gives the voltage of the cell. That's all good, we, we learned this in school. Meanwhile, the most important everyday battery remains this thing. Right. Who does not know that thing? Right. That's another Daniel cell configuration. But this is what, what the usual dry cell, the 1.5 volt thing, looks like inside. It's descended from the carbon zinc cell or battery of the late 19th century. Now, just a quick terminological note. Uh, strictly speaking, a battery is a whole collection of cells connected in series, but these days we call a single cell battery as well, so I'll use it interchangeably as well. This class of instruments has literally become iconic. Who doesn't recognize these symbols shown here? It is one of the few items of modern civilization that one expects to be able to buy at every street corner. But the dry cell is not the Daniel cell, as you saw in the picture, which, which means that most of us, even those of us who paid attention at school, had no idea how our everyday battery actually works. This, this connection between scientific knowledge and everyday life points to what I call the tragedy of everyday science. Meaning, even those of us who know quite a lot of science tend to be very ignorant about the most common and most important things that are in our daily lives. And this is a very sad situation. Until recently, I, I've known only one university level textbook that addresses the chemistry of the dry cell directly. And what we find there is a very frank admission in the red there, that things are complicated. In this paper, I try to tell the historical story of how we ended up in this situation. So that is the tale of two batteries, each with a complex history and long-standing one. On one side, John Frederick Daniel invented his so-called constant battery in the 1830s in a practical effort to stabilize the output of the then standard type of voltaic cell. Now, I wrote in the proposal for my forthcoming book, I quote myself, the Daniel cell has been an iconic textbook battery ever since its invention. That is not true. 
now I learned. The modern theoretical schema of the Danielson actually only dates back to the end of the 19th century. Meanwhile, uh, the dry cell began its commercial life with the Leclanché cell invented in 1866. This was not yet dry, it was full of liquid. Later versions were patented in Germany and the US in the 1880s. This is the unsung hero of modern civilization, powering flashlights, portable radios, electrical clocks, so many other things that we now take entirely for granted. The lineage of the dry cell can be traced back to Robert Bunsen of the Bunsen burner fame, who in 1842 replaced the platinum electrode in a grove cell with carbon, which was much cheaper. So you go back to William Grove as I will tell you in more detail. The tale of two batteries was not a tale of two cities to begin with. Daniel and Grove were working at the same time in very close proximity in London, although not together. Both strongly influenced by Faraday, Frank James's hero. Their instruments were both ultimately descended from Volta's original battery of 1800, and it will be interesting to see the divergent development of these two batteries in their material construction, theoretical understanding, and practical employment. This story will have also some interesting implications about the nature of scientific or techno-scientific knowledge. Today I will present some of the elements of the tale, but it's only the beginning. Now, let me come to the Daniel cell first. Daniel's initial motivation was very concrete to make a battery that would maintain a constant level of current by eliminating interfering material factors. But his purpose should not be mistaken as technological. It was certainly not commercial, as Jules Mertens points out. Yeah. Daniel was the first professor of chemistry at the newly founded King's College London, and he invented the constant battery as an instrument for lecture demonstrations and experimental research. Interestingly, however, within a decade, Batteries of his design were being used widely and profitably in electrometallurgy and telegraphy. Let me outline in some detail Daniel's steps leading to his invention. Daniel was following Faraday's electrochemical work, which had stated the law of proportionality in electrolysis between the amount of electricity passed and the amount of the resulting chemical change. Now, testing this relationship experimentally required measuring the amount of electricity passed. And that's not easy, unless what you can have is a steady level of current passing, in which case the total electric charge is A, simply the current multiplied by the amount of time elapsed. This is why Daniel initially wanted to have a battery that was constant in its action. Otherwise, why would you care? He didn't have any sensitive instruments that relied on the precise voltage. Now, what was the, called by then the common battery in England was a voltaic battery of a form designed by William Hyde Wollaston, employing copper and zinc electrodes in an acid. Um, acid could be hydrochloric or sulfuric. Now, because time is short today, uh, this is easier to explain in a semi-modern representation given here. The practical difficulties of the common battery were well known. For example, um, so let, let me just talk you through this, right? So the notion is that this zinc is acted on by the acid and, and ions are removed and the Three electrons are produced, they would have said electrical fluid. They flow over to the copper side, they come out into the solution, the electrons come out and they want to meet some positive ions. Right? So the first thing they do is meet the hydrogen ions, which is just in abundance in the acid. Um, and then what will happen is hydrogen bubbles form on the copper surface. But contrary to what this nice picture suggests, the bubbles do not all detach and rise through the liquid. 
So the copper, copper surface gets covered in bubbles, which reduces its effective area. Even worse, later on, the zinc plus ions will be picked up by the electrons. Then you'll get a zinc coating on the copper, which means zinc and zinc, there is no battery at all. So this problem had to be solved. As uh, Don Owen nicely explains, Davis Park, sorry, you're, you're getting to me, Frank, not David, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel's first innovation was to maximize the active surface area of copper by making it the container of the electrolyte rather than a little rod immersed in the electrolyte. That's very clever, right? So in this figure, the copper is shown as the large rectangular boundary of the whole cell. Uh, just this one first and then that one. Daniel's next step was the crucial one, using a barrier to keep the dissolved zinc, zinc ions to us, but zinc oxide to him, from reaching the copper side. The barrier, made of the gullet, esophagus, or bladder of a cow, is represented by the wavy lines on either side of the central bar, which is the zinc. So Daniel siphoned off the zinc collecting at the bottom of the area enclosed by the barrier, at the same time adding more acid from the top. So uh, you, this is hard to see what this says is ox gullet, right? This is the zinc rod in the middle, copper casing, and is siphoning off the dissolved zinc from here, adding more zinc. Right? So it, is the picture clear enough? Yeah, yes. that's important. And then Daniel's next innovation was to prevent the formation of hydrogen on the copper. This he achieved by using an electrolyte that does not contain hydrogen in the outer part of the cell. So he used copper sulfate instead of sulfuric acid. In modern formulae, CO, CuSO4 instead of H2SO4. This substitution worked out very well and had the additional advantage that uh, fresh copper was continually deposited on the copper surface and this would be soon exploited as an amazing technique for electro deposition so engravings multiplied all kinds of wonderful stuff Daniel was very pleased with this battery which lasted I quote between four to six hours only with slight deviations or diminution in power that tells you what a long way we Right. I mean, we complain if this thing doesn't last a whole year in the clock. Four to six hours was great for Daniel. Now, we're not finished yet. In a follow-up paper, um, Daniel rather quietly announced the replacement of the sulfuric acid with uh, zinc sulfate on the zinc side. So that's number four on the slide there. Why? This seems like it was an accident. So the sulfuric acid in the cell gradually turns into zinc sulfate as more and more zinc is dissolved. Yet, Daniel found that this did not result in a diminution of action. So he thought, why bother with the acid? Why not use the zinc sulfate to begin with? Another innovation which rendered the apparatus much more stable and easier to handle was the replacement of the animal membrane with porous earthenware, as he called it, or unglazed ceramic. Now we have the direct ancestor of the Daniel cell of modern textbooks. So, to summarize, Daniel did not set out to devise a new theoretical scheme for batteries, but his practical improvements led step by step to an arrangement that came to be called the Daniel cell, which eventually embodied and illustrated the theoretical core of what I will be calling the chemical imbalance system of battery science. More on that on a different occasion. What Daniel learned in the course of improving his instruments was that the least wasteful arrangement was to have each metal chemically reacting with the solution of itself. Not an obvious idea to begin with. In terms of later theory, this makes a lot of sense. It allows the half cell voltage to be calculated simply as the, differ 
in, in, in as the redox potential on each side and the overall cell voltage as the difference of the two half cells. This conceptual simplicity is what made the Daniel cell so appealing to later textbook writers. Now when, where and how exactly it became entrenched in textbooks is a story that I have yet to learn. Another large task is to learn how Daniel and his 19th century successors understood the mechanism of the cell without the modern concepts of electrons or ions. It's a huge subject which I'm going to have to struggle with later on. Now let me come to the dry cell. The Grove cell, which I mentioned as the distant ancestor of the dry cell, was actually so much like the Daniel cell that they were often discussed as variants of the same thing. The Grove cell also had two electrolytes separated by a permeable barrier, but it used some different materials. A zinc electrode in dilute sulfuric acid, as in the original configuration of Daniel, but a platinum electrode in strong nitric acid on the other side. Because of that, it was often referred to as the nitric acid battery, and it had a, and a reputation for being very strong in its action. Power was Grove's main concern, rather than constancy, which was Daniel's. Now, Grove stated that the idea of the nitric acid battery came to him from an experiment showing, I quote, a well-known uh, chemical phenomenon to depend upon electricity. So it's a well-known chemical phenomenon and he discovered that it actually depended on electricity. This phenomenon was the solution of gold in aqua regia. Jenny's alchemist, well, not her personal ones, but other <laughs> alchemists discovered this long ago. Aqua regia is a mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acid with some weird and wonderful properties, including that it can dissolve gold. Now, Grove says he dissolved a piece of gold dipped in hydrochloric acid, our HCl, by connecting it with a piece of gold dipped in nitric acid. The two acids not being in direct contact but being separated by a porous barrier, just the kind used in Daniel cell. Now, this is one of the things that you know I read in the history and I say, nah, that's not going to happen. So I had to see if it would happen. Now, that's his description, but I'm going to read that while showing you this photo, which is the setup I made in order to replicate Grove's experiment. So Grove says, I quote, into the bottom of a wine glass, I cemented the bowl of a tobacco pipe. So take a pipe, break off the stem, and that's the bowl. Right? You have to seal up the little hole. Into this was poured pure nitric acid. So in the little white thing. They don't make these anymore, but you can buy them from antique shops. I got about 25 from eBay, so if you, if you really want them, send you one. So nitric acid into the tobacco pipe, while muriatic, which is hydrochloric acid, was poured into the wine glass to the same level. In this latter acid, two strips of gold leaf, you see at the far end, Two strips of gold leaf were allowed to remain for an hour, at the end of which they remained as bright as when they first immersed, when they when first immersed. So you see, they, they're being fine, they're intact. And then this is a gold wire right, attached to the green clip. So it says, uh, a gold wire was now made to touch the nitric acid and the extremity of one of the strips of gold leaf so what he's doing is connecting uh, this gold wire dipped here with one of these two strips. And what I'm doing is, I mean, this red clip, as you can see, is cut off. It's just holding that gold leaf. The yellow one through a meter is connected to the green clip. So the connection is made, and Grove says this, that gold leaf on the right-hand side was instantly dissolved while the other strip remained intact. So we say really, and here we go. Just literally one minute later, 
Now you see this weird pattern because the gold leaf is so thin it's actually pasted onto a piece of paper. So you're seeing the paper behind the gold itself quite well destroyed. And here's another rendition. Here I, I'm mounting a gold leaf very thin onto a piece of plastic bag. And this time it's just one leaf connected in the same way. Again, after a minute, it's destroyed very nicely. Now, how does this experiment work? Grove said, in the blue there, um, both the acids are decomposed, the hydrogen of the muriatic hydrochloric unites with the oxygen of the nitrate making water, and the chlorine for, left over in the hydrochloric side attacks the gold. Okay, I mean, long story there to dig into, but I'm not going to do that today. <coughs> But what he noted also is that a strong current of electricity flow, flowed in this setup. So he tried to use it as a battery. And it really does make a battery. So it's 0.37 volt of power being generated there. Um, and Grove additionally thought he could now we come to the point. He could strengthen the action of the battery by replacing the gold on the hydrochloric side with zinc and the gold on the nitric side with platinum and explain this reasoning in terms of relative chemical affinities again this is a long story he also changed the hydrochloric acid to sulfuric acid for various reasons and then we have the grove nitric acid cell now the use of platinum in this cell was a key aspect of its departure from the daniel cell so, in Daniel cell, the positive terminal was copper, which was seen to attract the copper ions in, from the <coughs> copper sulfate. This was later seen as the redox reaction of copper, contributing a distinct half-cell voltage, about 0.34. In contrast, no one spoke about the solution or oxidation of platinum, and its well-known chemical inactivity is why Grove used the platinum in the first place. Then when Bunsen replaced the platinum in the growth cell with carbon, as I mentioned before, this theoretical point was accentuated even further. A carbon electrode in an acid does not participate at all in a redox reaction or any other chemical reaction. It only works as a conduit of electrons, a conductor of electricity, the flow of which into the solution causes other reactions in the electrolyte around the carbon. Now, working out the chemistry that happens around, so that's, that's the Bunsen <coughs> setup. Working out the chemistry that happens around the carbon in the electrolyte has remained a significant challenge. If we may fast forward to the modern carbon-zinc battery, there's a simple question one must pose. Why does it produce 1.5 volt of voltage, EMF? This is not an easy question to answer. When I make a very simple cell with zinc and carbon in acid, I only get 1.1 volt. So something in the more complex electrolyte in the carbon-zinc cell, which is not at all just an acid or just one thing at all, that complexity adds the 0.4 volt. In learning how this might work, actually the Wikipedia entry on zinc carbon battery is not a bad place to start. And I won't give you all the details, but you can see on one side yeah, is the simple zinc redox reaction. On the other side, ah, the electrolyte is actually a mixture of manganese oxide, ammonium chloride, and other things. Wikipedia admits, I quote, the battery has an electromotive force of about 1.5. The approximate nature of the EMF is related to the complexity of the cathode reaction. And it's even worse than that. I mean, it tells you point, minus 0 0.76 and plus 0.5. The difference between those two is not 1.5. So what are we talking about? I'm really not sure. More work to do. So the development of the dry cell as a commercial device is a story for which I have no time nor much knowledge yet today. 
So we're not quite going to get to mass production in this talk, but I'm, I'm almost. I just want to highlight one small moment before I finish. There was a thing called the Burnley Carbon Zinc Dry Cell, circa 1890. This was a, a product marketed by the General Electric Company. And this one had paste, right? So how the dry cell became dry, initially they put they used plaster, what they call plaster of Paris, soaked that in the electroline so it was more portable and not, not as messy. Uh, the, this general electric battery has pastes, right? Two different pastes inserted in the space between the carbon rod and the zinc casing, seemingly in direct contact with each other. What was called the black paste in the inner layer, in contact with carbon, consisted of manganese dioxide, carbon, magnesia, lime, ferric oxide, ammonia, and water, etc. The other one, white paste in the outer layer, had lime, ammonia, chlorine, and water, and blending, binding materials. So it's going to be a whole messy situation, not easy to analyze. And, and this, this analysis was actually not provided by General Electric, which probably wanted to keep it secret. We'll have to go and look at the patterns, uh, which we now can. Uh, but it was done by some independent analyst. The complexity you see here is quite typical of engineering, of course. But it is not engineering is not clearly separable from science in cases such as this. So let me now conclude. So that, in short, was the tale of the two batteries. They both originated from exactly the same ancestor. The main initial development was also the same, namely the division of the electrolyte with a barrier capable of electric conduction. From that common point of origin, the Daniel cell evolved into a beautifully teachable arrangement that is both materially and conceptually tidy. The growth cell metamorphosed into the dry cell a device practically superior to any Daniel cell, but achieving that superiority only through a fine ad hoc control of some very complex chemistry. In both cases, the interaction between technological concerns and conceptual understanding was complex and subtle. And progress in this domain was not driven by theoretical principles. If anything, theory was in fact strongly shaped by technological developments. And here I, I think of a nice saying from William James, who said, truth is something that happens to an idea. And I think when you look at the Daniel Cell, the truth of the redox concept, conception painfully and gradually happened to it. So I think um, there are some very useful historical and philosophical insights to be gained from this double case study. In addition, I hope that such studies will do something positive to ameliorate what I have called the tragedy of everyday science. Thank you for your attention.